Um, so, kia ora koutou. welcome everybody to this extended session of the Virtual Atrium Symposium and I want to personally thank um, Rebecca Kittle and all of the organising team for making this possible. It's been really an enriching experience and we have the opportunity to have guests from all over the world, which has been great. Um, and today I'm really happy to introduce um, Charles Davis who is an assistant professor of architectural history and criticism at the University of Buffalo in Western New York. Um, Charles has a very impressive track record of research um, looking at many areas of 19th century and modern American architectural history, but in particular, concentrating on the role of racial identity and race thinking in, uh, in those disciplines. Um, and he is also one of the co-organizers of the Race and Modern Architecture Project, along with Irene Cheng and Mabel Wilson. Um, that group has organized a series of events, and out of those events, um, they've produced this very important and timely book called Race and Modern Architecture, which has just come out from the University of Pittsburgh Press a few months ago, um, and it's that larger project that we have invited Charles to talk to us about. So welcome Charles and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, so I'm going to start just by sharing a, a, um, a file and, and talking through some images. Um, and this first image here is the image that I always use to start my history surveys. Um, primarily um, History 2, looking at the early modern period until the mid 20th century. Um, and this um, particular image is really good for two reasons. One, because it um, critiques the tendency that we have in architecture to primarily fixate on the building as an object by relating it back to the people who have made them. So from roughly the, uh, the mid uh, or the late 18th century or the 19th century over to the 20th century, um, I'm showing you images of some of the premier buildings um, that were uh, designed and constructed during that time period. But um, primarily, I've got this suite of images from um, doing an exercise that I do with my students at the end of every year. I ask them to look at uh, an authoritative or canonical architectural history, go into the bibliography, and list the top 25 people who have been um, cited in the back. So who has the most number of pages, the greatest number of discussions, and to tell me what is similar about them. And then I have them do a demographical um, survey of that uh, sample. And so every year, uh, students realize that uh, all of the people who have been discussed are European or European American, part of the European diaspora. They're all male, they're all Christian, and they're all heterosexual. And so there's a there's a tendency or bias in terms of who is um, used as the most authoritative figures in architectural history. Um, and then I ask them to comment on who's missing. Uh, and uh, it's clear from the demography sort of um, uh, who is missing from that list. Uh, let's see if I can move on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the second thing that I do, uh, particularly in the History 2 class, is that I show them how architects, particularly in the um, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, try to emulate power and the, and the emergence of the profession as something that is different from uh, a regular builder or somebody who is a craftsman, but the architect as artist, someone who uh, understands and can read Latin, who is a geometer, somebody who uh, is artistically oriented. Um, and these two images here give you a sense of uh, how, uh, at least uh, in France uh, during uh, the Enlightenment, uh, there, architects tried to pattern themselves after royalty. So on the uh, left side is an image of actual royalty, and you can see the, the royal blue, sometimes it's royal red or royal purple, uh, with the diadem, uh, the, the, the decorative uh, diadem hanging from his neck, uh, the, the staff uh, dignifying uh, his position in society. And then you look at the architect, and it's interesting that uh, he also has the royal blue, and he has a diadem hanging around his neck. But around him, what he has is, are, are books to designate that he's a literate person. And in the background are representations of his uh, architectural work. And you can see the same thing happening in European countries as they nationalize 
And uh, even as we start to modernize, I have a couple of images between um, the uh, ruler of Vienna and uh, Otto Wagner uh, as they're starting to modernize, let's say. And so um, this is, is, is trying to get the students to understand that there's a relationship between power and the architect's status. And the fact that they tend to produce and reproduce the elite structures of power, not by accident, but because that is literally historically how um, architects have, have garnered their influence. And then lastly, I show them this image, uh, which uh, covers the countries and the distributions of uh, the countries that are covered in particularly histories of modern architecture, uh, which tend to gravitate towards the spaces in the global north or, or uh, settler colonies like Australia. And then all the areas in red are the ones that tend to be, um, I, mean, I don't know how you want to say it, isolated, exiled, quarantined in history one courses. So these are the sort of pre-modern slash primitive uh, cultures. Uh, and I show them this to, to let them know that uh, the, the world that they are going to practice in today is a global society. And very often they will be called upon to design in an area that they did not grow up in and have no familiarity with. And so in order to uh, help them to become familiar with a kind of strategy of understanding how to mine the history of these spaces and to understand cultural differences, I tell them that the goal nowadays is to teach a global history. And so all of these images are really meant to kind of critique uh, canonical histories of Western architecture. And to get students to think about what are the racial politics that subtend uh, both the histories that they celebrate, maybe even their studio professors celebrate, or the histories that are amplified when they're given precedence in studio um, only from particular parts of the world or from particular types of designers. Um, and so this was the impetus for both uh, the, the book projects I'm showing here, uh, the one on the left being uh, the book that grew out of my dissertation, building character, the racial politics of modern architecture style, looking at the ways that race and style theory were integrated uh, in the paradigm of architectural organicism or the uh, theories of design that model design practices after um, uh, theories of nature and the way that nature generates form. And then secondly, um, as was mentioned earlier, the Race and Modern Architecture volume, a critical history from the Enlightenment to the present, which then tries to look at this more expansively uh, from the Enlightenment to uh, contemporary discourses in terms of the themes within which um, both arise from modernism, but uh, were, were central in terms of integrating race theory within them. And so I just wanna give you a sense of what's inside of the volume. Um, here are the different rubrics that we um, looked at across um, time. Uh, so they're thematically organized, uh, and you can sort of move chronologically from the Enlightenment uh, to the present. Uh, but the first is race and enlightenment, race and organicism, and nationalism, then race and representation, then colonialism and urbanism. Um, and then throughout that, there's a kind of networking of these themes. So you can see, for example, um, nationalist themes and colonialism come together in some chapters, post-colonial ideas, settler colonial ideas being uh, explored. Um, et cetera. Um, and, and so I want to just um, briefly go over a few of the, the principles that I think will be useful in terms of uh, the racial critiques of the discipline that have come out of this project that might be useful in a studio context, particularly um, for places where professional architects are trained, either through the architectural history course or through the general culture of the place. Um, so these are the things that, um, uh, as we're doing, for example, here at the beginning of the year, thinking of a colloquium on race and power, um, what do we want to look for? What are the things that we want to reform in our curriculum? One of the first things is that the aesthetic standards of architecture are based almost exclusively on European definitions of art. So even though the practices of design uh, are global and international, the internal standards, the norms, uh, are um, based on a, a European discourse. And that in itself is fine, but if we look at the third uh, point on this list, uh, the cultural bias inherent in that tends to remain invisible because we label European standards universal principles of art. 
And so it's the universality, the assumption that uh, these standards will, will migrate and carry everywhere that is really in question here. Um, secondly, enlightenment definitions of architecture tend to stratify the intellectual and physical labor of buildings in ways that amplify racial and class divisions. So um, this should take you back to the second image that I showed where the architect is uh, dressed in raiment that's very much paralleling that of royalty. Uh, and the, the labor that the architect is said to do and to perform is intellectual or artistic, which is somehow different from the physical labor of buildings. And I'll show you a couple of case studies from the volume that show why this tends to amplify racial and class divisions. And lastly, professional schools tend to use a whitewashed history of architecture to normalize this exclusive system of power. So it's very difficult to expect students to be able to read through and to be critical of these uh, ideas, principles, and standards when uh, we're not giving them the, the language and vocabulary to critique these cultural biases. And so um, within the volume itself, uh, there are just a few examples that I want to talk about. I mean, there are many. I think there's so many wonderful chapters. Um, I encourage you to look through the, the volume. But just a, a couple for a discussion here. Uh, this is an image taken of the Capitol, U.S. Capitol building, taken from Peter Minoche's um, essay in the first section, Race and the Enlightenment, where he talks about the tension that emerges between the representational imagery and meaning of this building as somehow taking the best of European discourses and trying to refine them to represent American democracy and the principles of freedom um, and egalitarianism. And the fact that this building and, and many others in Washington, D.C. Uh, that were constructed for this reason, this representational reason, uh, were built with slave labor. And so the actual um, capitalist and racial capitalism that was used as a foundation for wealth building in the beginning of the founding of the nation is whitewashed with the imagery uh, of the, the building itself. And so Minoche explores in his chapter uh, the ways that this creates a kind of paradox uh, within uh, this, the use of both this architectural style, but also uh, with the enlightenment uh, ideas of uh, universality uh, and liberty um, not being applied equally uh, in the US context. And here is an image from uh, Diane Harris's chapter, um, which really tries to draw a connection between two disparate images, at least within the American imagination, because we tend to segregate them, not just in terms of the settings and the actual functions of these spaces, but the communities that they serve. So on the left side, um, Harris explores the um, construction of an idealized uh, gypsum uh, community where architects were challenged to create um, pioneering designs that would show the potential of these spaces. And also to typify what the uh, traditional American middle-class household might look like. But on the right side, what we have is an image of the funeral for Emmett Till, the um, boy who was uh, captured by um, whites, uh, who said they were with the police, but were actually not with the police, uh, took him away uh, and uh, beat him and killed him and then sunk his body at the bottom of a uh, body of water uh, as a, a means of maintaining uh, the separation between the blacks and white, black and white races, uh, purportedly because he whistled at a white woman and uh, was disrespectful for them. And what Harris does is she shows that these two worlds are uh, intimately connected with one another, both uh, structurally at the economic level and at the political level, but even socially, that the segregation of black and white spaces was required in order to make the kind of um, image that you see on the left and the kind of, of ways that people could reify whiteness and middle class whiteness and provide a space of social uplift and economic uplift for one group of people uh, was done on the backs of another group of people. And so reading between these black and white uh, images, uh, both uh, previously in the case of the Capitol building, in terms of the buildings that represent the state, but also in these domestic spaces and everyday spaces, we can see how uh, race and architecture come together in ways that tend not to come through always in the representational imagery of it, but uh, within the, the content of it historically. 
And so if we were to take these ideas and these critiques and try and apply them toward an anti-racist discipline, you know, how, how can we use the lessons gleaned from this volume to both um, reform architectural history as a, a kind of um, field on its own, but also even perhaps architecture as a, both a profession and a discipline more broadly. These are some of the points that I would offer. Um, there are more, but these are the ones I'll focus on here. First is that an anti-racist curriculum must be founded upon a critique of the whiteness of our discipline. And um, I'll just say this without naming names, but there are some people in Ivy League schools who are trying to reform the discipline without first critiquing its whiteness uh, by saying that the aesthetics of uh, the, the practice and the discipline are accessible to all communities and that somehow this equal accessibility and the equal agency of how people can use this uh, uh, as if aesthetics can be equal to politics or a social agency on its own, really tries to revise the project of formalism without first critiquing its whiteness. And at, at least from my perspective, I reject this kind of orientation. Um, there's no way to really revise our discipline and to produce an anti-racist discipline without first understanding how our discipline is racist and what are those tendencies. And then secondly, uh, what must be done is that we must actively recover the voices and perspectives of non-white agents. Um, and this can be done in several ways. I'll speak about it briefly when I talk about how we might reform the whiteness of our profession uh, to actually be uh, more pluralistic. Second, the faculty and student body must consist of non-white people's in positions of authority, both in terms of uh, who is running the space and the administration, and in terms of instruction, in terms of who are your studio um, uh, leaders, who are your studio instructors, the patrons of, of the, um, the space. Studio instructors must reject the notion that good design only consists of monumental forms or technological innovation. And this is important because uh, if you think back to that image of the global north and the global south, these ideas of monumentalism and technological innovation have been used to separate these two areas, to create a category of primitive or the pre-modern for some areas, the, ver the vernacular, as uh, some have referred to it in architectural history, and uh, this idea of the avant-garde, those moving us in advance of society, uh, tradition, traditional society, and showing us what the future should maintain. Um, when in fact, uh, even um, so-called vernacular cultures are quite modern. They exist in the present, they deal with the present, and there's a complexity that is, um, must be acknowledged in those spaces that is uh, belied by a reductive categorization of the imagery uh, of the architecture. And then finally, uh, a history of architecture must consist of a cultural history of the built environment, not a canon of good works. Um, and I say this in terms of reforming studio culture, primarily because the beginning of every year, I get a lot of students who come to me and say, Professor Davis, I have a studio project. I'd love it if you'd give me 15 precedents that would help me study this project or, or to, to perform this project. And they believe that because I'm the architectural story and I have an encyclopedic knowledge of all of the different forms that existed through time. And I can just give them 17 that would allow them to make a really innovative project. Um, sometimes I do, but even if I did not, um, I, I wouldn't want to get them in the practice of thinking that that's what history is for. So I try to disavow them of this canonical um, notion of history, period. And I also don't teach them a survey because that lends itself to a canonical list of 100 or 150 buildings, but instead try to model for them how would you analyze history using problems and primary sources. And so um, through a case study methodology, I try to get them to understand how history works. Secondly though, I, I tend to reverse um, uh, Nicholas Pevner's distinction between Lincoln Cathedral and the bike shed, uh, where one is a building and the other is architecture capital A, by saying that it is all architecture and we need to understand the built environment, the history of the built environment more broadly. And, and hopefully this would, both save me sometimes, so I don't have to give them these lists, but also disavow them of thinking of history as this 
service tool for studio. It's actually a space of reflection, contemplation, and even knowledge production for some of the areas that they're going to find a hist that a history has not been constructed. And so we need our architects to be doing this work for us as well, um, especially if they're building these spaces that historians may not have had the time to, to go through and create the archives for. And so lastly, I want to talk a little bit about then, you know, how would we practically go about then reforming the whiteness of our profession? Um, and, you know, I've had people invite me to give talks on this, and I, I get the sense that they, they want me to, to tell them that there's a pain-free way of doing this, that there's a way that you can reform whiteness without feeling guilty or, or shameful or, or bad about what happened in history. And, and um, I, I don't think that that's really possible. You know, I think that like the, the trauma of white supremacy, as it's been applied in many areas of the world, including in architecture, requires a, a truthful unpacking. So that part is part of the process of going through learning the history. But I don't think that shame and blame are the, the, um, the endpoints of it, however. And I agree a lot with Linda Martine Alcoff's um, uh, diagnosis. So she is a philosopher uh, she, um, and a phenomenologist. Um, I'm looking critically at her phenomenology. She's in the CUNY system. Uh, and uh, she's uh, written several essays on the phenomenology of race and of whiteness specifically, thinking of it as a kind of lived habit. Uh, and she's trying to critique some of those on the left who reduce whiteness to only an ideology. It's only a structural kind of behavior. Um, and she wants to make a distinction between whiteness as an ideology and whiteness as a kind of lived social reality, that there are some people who are Italian-Americans, uh, who are Polish-Americans, or, or whatever kind of uh, ethnic uh, division of whiteness that exists for them, uh, who aren't thinking primarily about whiteness through an ideological lens, although it operates and subtends the reality, but they're passing on uh, living traditions to their, their sons and daughters, and that uh, before the modern period, uh, this was not always based on white supremacy. And she's hoping that there's a way that uh, in this kind of uh, post, um, some call it post-racial period, or this uh, post-period of, of um, uh, wokeness for, for people today, that we can move to, on to something that is not just about white supremacy either, but is a kind of uh, identity, a racial identity like any other identity. And so in order to do that, she says that we need to divest whiteness of this idea of white supremacy or exceptionalism, while reinvesting in his notion of particularity. Uh, and she is really interested in doing this historically, looking at the ways that peoples and groups have migrated from one area to another, have developed uh, ideas of self and community. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that she's looking to the working class groups within uh, white, and, she's, and I'm speaking now here of the American context specifically, but she's looking at the working class groups who have either formed coalitions with people of color or activist positions that identify themselves as being outsiders to this myth of white supremacy. Uh, so in the, uh, the one of the most, um, Common examples are uh, those whites in the South uh, who were um, uh, in a long line of either indentured servitudes or, or people who were in the, the uh, working classes who didn't own large plantations and didn't have lots of slaves. Uh, but also they did not um, imbibe in this idea that because they were white and could be overseers over a black slave population, that somehow this made them better. Instead, they wanted a kind of economic equality with those who owned plantations. And they didn't see the slaves as the problem, but they saw the class structure uh, and the, the uh, use of white supremacy to cover over that as the problem. And so Alcoff is really interested in tracking these kinds of revolutionary groups, uh, it, whether in class terms or social terms, to understand how to reform whiteness. So there, she, she believes you can trace a kind of cultural identity through that lineage. And then she hopes in the end that whites can eventually become just one of many racial groups in America. Or if we were to use uh, Jesse Jackson's phrase, one of the rainbow, right? He's talking about the rainbow coalition of people of color who come together. Uh, and she wants uh, for uh, white uh, Americans to be able to fit into that space as well. Uh, but in order to move toward this way, and I think this is more of a kind of you know, liberal path or moderate path, uh, it's, in, it's in distinction from someone like Noel Ignatiev's, uh, Ignatiev's idea that Whiteness needs to just be obliterated, period. We should not no longer have any kind of category that's called white. 
uh, but we should uh, move toward either uh, anti-racist uh, new identity or the elimination of racial identities in the future. Uh, or this notion that some on the left tend to do, which is to um, essentialize whiteness as only an ideology and not be able to see uh, the ways that it creates particularity in, in and of itself through the different groups that exist. Um, and so my uh, thinking on this is that in order to, to do this, a kind of uh, critical historical process that Alcoff is doing at this larger scale needs to happen within architectural discourse. And for me, it's become a kind of methodology where I'm really interested in looking at canonical examples of architecture, understanding what the racial politics are within them. But in most of the cases, um, what I find is that while there is a kind of white supremacist notion uh, operative within them, uh, that this doesn't necessarily mean that the use of that uh, modernist concept or enlightenment concept uh, is completely compromised, uh, but it does mean that um, we have to be carefully parsing through historical study what elements of these discourses are actually still fruitful and productive for the present. And uh, at least for me, that's a pretty exciting um, method because it brings history back into the forefront of how it is that we can extend architectural practices and understand how we can contextualize architectural practices uh, in these different spaces. Um, of course, I, I think that um, one way of doing this is to uh, foreground the experiences of people of color, not just to write them into the gaps of history, but to be able to understand what whiteness is from multiple perspectives. So how do African Americans understand it? How do indigenous communities understand it? How do the Latinx communities understand it? And how do white Americans understand it? And if we do that architecturally, I think we get a, a fuller sense of what that, that social identity might actually be able to become from multiple perspectives. Um, and you know, then we probably have the same figure, but uh, we would re recognize and acknowledge things like um, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, homophobia, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, racist attitude towards uh, non-whites, uh, as well as his innovative uh, creativities with geometry and his organic uh, sense of what architecture was within the American landscape. And that that would be a full story, a full telling of these characters as opposed to a partial telling. Uh, and that full story would always then be a kind of warning against a white supremacist attitude. And it would allow for us to write in multiple perspectives on what architecture could be what these canonical um, categories like organicism, representation, urbanism uh, could be in these spaces. And at least to my mind, make a, a, a fuller and more interesting um, ground for debate within the discourse. So, I mean, this is all very sketched out and provisional. I hope that it, at least it's clear with the, the uh, bullet points. I'm hoping that then we can generate some kind of discussion then um, uh, amongst our, ourselves, either with questions of clarification or um, with, um, you know, points of debate uh, that we could talk about. Kiara Charles, thank you so much for that uh, really provocative and suggestive uh, presentation. I'm hoping you have time to answer some questions and have a conversation. Thank you. So what I'm going to ask people in the audience to do is to use the raise hand function. Um, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment and we'll take it from there. I have a question, but I can't work out how to raise my hand. I'm sorry. Just go ahead, go ahead, Ben. <laughs> um, thank you, Charles. That was really interesting and um, really appreciate um, the getting a kind of a US perspective on some of these issues. Um, and I think we've we've been talking and thinking about some of the same things, slightly different contexts and slightly different issues here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I guess one of the things I was interested in is this, I, I was trying to think whether you were talking about, um, you know, could we be moving towards uh, a world where, where whiteness was, a, was an almost a sort of ethnic or a cultural group. And um, I was trying to think, oh, how would that, would that work here in, in New Zealand? And, and, um, and how does that work? And, I, and one of the, um, 
sorry, this is going to be a fluffy question, but uh, one of the things that I've been doing this morning actually is is having an email conversation with a um, a p- person at another university in in New Zealand about a journal art- a journal issue that's entitled Māori Landscapes, and one of the people that's editing this journal is Canadian Lebanese, I think, is is her kind of cultural ethnic background. And I was asking, are you, will you be requiring people to um, outline their positionality in in their, um, you know, at the start of their articles or somehow acknowledging, you know, whose voice is is writing here? And I think um, this has been kind of a bit of a focus of my own work is sort of, you know, Whose, whose voices get get heard and I think what happens in New Zealand is if you're Māori or you're Pacific you articulate who you are you articulate your kind of cultural or ethnic background but if you're Pākehā which is the Māori word for um, well there's a, there's a range of different understandings but generally kind of European New Zealander um, but not kind of recent migrant would be the broadly accepted way of defining Pākehā. Um, people don't articulate that as their positionality. They, there's just, there's no, there's no kind of articulation of who, of who somebody is, I guess, or where they're from or where their voices are from. And I just wondered if, um, what happens in, in, in your space and in your, your world and society, whether, whether people kind of, um, make an effort to say who their voice is or who they're coming from, what peoples they're coming from, and, and whether this might be a sort of step in the direction of, um, you know, if people, if I acknowledge my Pākehā side, so I've got a very strong kind of Pākehā side on my dad's side, and, I'm, you know, that roots me to this place, but it also means that I'm, you know, New Zealand European as well as being Indigenous, um, whether that's a kind of step in the direction of of, of whiteness being a, a mm-hmm. cultural category, I guess. Mm-hmm. No, I think it's a it's a really good question, um, and I, I I'm gonna get, I'm gonna answer your question, but I also would really love to hear whether the situation that I'm gonna describe in the states is similar mm-hmm. there, uh, because there are very specific um, political reasons, historical reasons, cultural reasons why people re- respond in this way. Um, but I mean, I've been teaching courses on race and architecture for about twelve years. And with students and fellow faculty members, um, when you ask people to, and I used to do this in my class, where I ask people to identify like what you are, what is your identity, where do you come from, how do you understand yourself? Um, and uh, students who are white um, find it embarrassing to talk about their race because um, when, when you talk about whiteness as a racial category, it's either understood as white supremacist kind of, you know, white nationalists understand you can't be proud of it, too proud of it, or you sound, you know, nationalist. Sure. Um, and and um, it goes against this idea of both American individualism, which is that, you know, it's really your individual efforts that matter more, or this idea of universalism within American society, that we're, we're all the same, so it doesn't really matter what my race is, I don't ever talk about my race. And um, slowly over the course of the semester, my students realize that white students don't talk about their race because whiteness is the norm within American society. So they don't have to because everything is bent towards them. Um, and um, so that's one thing that they have to realize. But the other thing that they become comfortable with is trying to understand how to talk about their whiteness without reifying white supremacy. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people rely on this idea or this um, mythology of America as a nation of immigrants. So my parents were immigrants and I, they came from, you know, Italy through Ellis Island, and, and they you know, moved here and here and here, and eventually we lost the language and we became this kind of homogenized state. But progressively, as I've been adding these settler coloni- colonialist lens to my classes, where uh, America was not always a nation of immigrants, that there were people from, you know, a- through Asiatic migrations who came to the Bering Straits, who were indigenous communities in America, and they had um, everything from, you know, um, nomadic cultures to Cahokia, which is a, you know, a huge monumental uh, space. And that this uh, culture, Native American culture or indigenous culture, depending on who's the speaker, um, was erased and uh, both physically, literally erased by uh, European contact and invasion, 
uh, over a long period of complex negotiations where initially indigenous subjects were in charge because they had the greater numbers and they could dictate political relations. And then slowly, um, as Europeans grew a number and could use military force to, to um, dispossess uh, the natives of their land. Um, that was the initial mark. But then secondarily, um, and this is the, what was most striking for my white students as they realized this, is that there's a rhetorical erasure of native uh, subject of native history. And so um, everything from commander in chief being the new type of um, head of state to um, only thinking of native peoples as sort of already extinct and not existing or somehow always stuck in a primitive space. And so uh, even, even troubling this idea of like uh, America is this nation of immigrants for them, you know, kind of leaves them with nothing. There's no bedrock, right? Like, they don't know how to talk about whiteness. Either it's too embarrassing and they sound like a Nazi or they sound nostalgic and myth-making in terms of American idea. And, but what I, what I want them to leave the class with um, is that um, this is actually a productive space. Like to actually have the question in your mind means that you can be making it into something. But if you can never articulate it and you never have to talk about it, then it becomes a problem. Uh, now that's the positive side. The negative side, at least from my perspective, as a person of color who wants to talk about race and architecture broadly, is that I feel I have to hold the hands of a lot of the white students in my class because they're used to being the center of discussion. Uh, and and the, uh, some students, anyway, don't want to say the wrong things, you know? Uh, so they're, they're worried about sounding, you know, uh, un, uh, clueless or racist or whatever. Uh, and so um, it, it is, it, it's become like literally a skill to learn how to talk about whiteness in the United States mm -hmm. without having people, you know, run out of the classroom screaming or burning something down or calling you a racist and, and reporting you to, the, to uh, the administration, right? And so in America, you know, I find that, you know, because our students don't know our history, they're not well prepared to understand how clueless they are. And then when you speak to them about it, you have to be so uh, circumspect in how you do it because there's such defensiveness around it. And, and it's all because, you know, they've been told these myths from fourth grade, you know, like this is what America is and this is what everybody should become. And we learn the myths more than we learn the history. And so I find myself having to unteach, to get them to unlearn these patterns. Um, and I mean, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing. Like I, I stuck with architecture, right? So clearly I must think it's like interesting and I, I keep doing it, but I find myself constantly speaking to clueless white people and doing it in ways that won't offend them. And that that's a lot of the time that I spend, right? Uh, and, and so if we really want to do this, this work with the canon, at least from my perspective, I feel like it needs to be white liberals who need to get up off their butts and do the work, like do some of this work and have these conversations when I'm not around and people aren't in my class. Uh, and uh, I feel like, you know, the, the pressures that we now have in the wake of the George Floyd protests uh, with even corporations trying to find out how they can increase racial equity because there's a, a global call for this. Um, that there's, there's an opportunity here to do that, but that it's from my perspective, it's not the Southern racists. You know, it's not the white nationalists that are the problem. They've always been there. Their agenda is pretty clear and they're pretty, you know, staunch in how they're going to do it, right? Like get rid of voting rights and, and, suppress people, make sure they remain poor, and they have to keep working, and they don't have time to like do anything else, right? It's the white liberals that I find are the problem. Like They don't know how to speak up and do their, their role. And so uh, their silence is actually uh, working as a kind of condoning of this work. And so I find that it's really motivating white people to stop being afraid of their own shadow and to just talk about it. Like, what is whiteness, right? Because I think it could become something very interesting, but it would require like it, it becoming an active social project. And I don't know if a lot of Americans are really ready for that. Like they're, they're, they're kind of just so afraid of like being racist that they don't know how to do that. But, uh, and, I, and I told people this a little bit um, when Trump was elected. Um, it was really weird for me as a person of color. One, because I could see it coming from 100 miles away. But two, it just seemed like identity politics had transitioned to the space where whites were fighting whites. They were trying to define what America was, what whiteness was. And it seems like, you know, for me that 
um, we've reached a point in the States where that's got to be the next cultural project, the redefining America and the redefining point. And there are some people that get it. I think there are enough that could push that. But I don't know if it's true in New Zealand and other kind of settler colonial states, whether the kind of myth building uh, replaces people's knowledge of it or whether it builds in them a kind of um, apprehension to talk about whiteness or white pride in that way. But that's how it is in the state. Charles, maybe maybe I can jump in there. I know Hannah has um, a comment to make, but I, I do want to just say also that um, I think we have a sort of interesting inversion of the problem in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is a lot of um, liberals feel very comfortable that we are a officially bicultural country and it's built into our constitution and, and politics and laws and, and it's sort of easy for some of us to say, oh, we've covered that now, we're, we've, we're done, we're, we're beyond that. Um, um, so I, I really take your challenge to heart. Um, but Hannah, I know you had a, had a question. You have to unmute yourself, Hannah. Kia ora Charles, I'm Hannah Hopewell, I teach in the Landscape Architecture Program here in Victoria, Wellington. Um, yeah, I, I am responding to your kind of plea, I guess, that um, us white liberals, you know, need to um, do some labour here. And um, earlier, I'll just share some experience. So earlier this year in my fourth year studio class, I introduced um, in the well, populated the vocabulary of whiteness um, amongst the students, um, gave them a bit of re reading material, and attempted to, I uh, guess, establish um, a forum with which the, the, the word whiteness, which is many, uh, uncomfortable for many as you've addressed, um, could become kind of normal parlance. And with that, um, begin to trigger individual students to begin to confront their own tensions around that. Um, I have to say it didn't work very well, and and since and I've tried I've tried this in various different ways um, because I don't want to come in and teach it like a theory and go well actually you need to do this and so it's sort of like slowly populating this but it I get back silence and increasingly I'm I'm looking for tactics of of how to um, move that um, sort of sideways or forward. So, so my question would be, um, in your experience, maybe you could share a little bit about the tactics you use to, um, particularly with, with um, Pākehā or, or um, you know, white students, uh, with getting them to, to, to speak about it. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's a good question, actually. So I'll share two things. One is that I um, recently interviewed Leslie Naloko, who is now the Dean of CUNY, um, and she is a Ghanaian um, architect um, trained in the UK. Um, and she, she was the editor of White Papers, Black Mark, which is one of the first books published around 2000 uh, on, in race and architecture, primarily from the professional architectural side. And one of the things that she did in the last 10 years is that she established a new graduate program in Johannesburg. Uh, and the premise of that program was that they were gonna have a decolonized curriculum. And she said that um, that meant that black students would be free to experiment with what blackness means for them. And because they're in Africa and they're in a context where they don't have to think about blackness through the colonial lens per se, but they can think of it through a kind of productive local cultural lens, um, that they were experimenting with lots and lots of things. But she said that, um, a vocabulary didn't emerge for the entire school about what this really meant and what they were doing in terms of whiteness, blackness, what they were deconstructing until they had done it together as a school for two years. And so they, it had to be this kind of regular part of the curriculum where they were unlearning what they thought that they knew. And so literally some of them, as you say, would be mute. Like they wouldn't know what to say. They, they were like, I understand intellectually the problem they're saying, but like, one, how do I even talk about that? Mm -hmm. And then two, what does that mean architectural or like material? And so that's one thing that, that I found um, from her is that it has to be kind of an active culture that they meet several points throughout the curriculum. I think then it, it, it allows them to think, you know, uh, contrapuntally through, throughout the, the, the curriculum. But the other thing that I tend to do is um, I will talk about whiteness 
but I will challenge my white students to design spaces for people of color. And so as they're designing space for people of color, what I'm asking them to be cognizant of is not to whitewash or to whiten the space, but to look for authentic um, spaces or uh, roots of culture that they can then um, work with in a kind of improvisational way. And I'll give you an example. So for one studio, um, the last studio I taught here was an adaptive reuse studio of a primarily African-American neighborhood in the city of Buffalo, uh, Hamlin Park. It was primarily um, the, the home of doctors, lawyers, politicians, you know, kind of bourgeois class of African-Americans who couldn't live in the suburbs, so they lived in a segregated uh, black enclave. They inherited homes that were constructed and designed by developers for the white working classes. So essentially, they, they lived in homes that were these kind of American typologies for European Americans, but th they lived black lives. And I asked my students to literally critique the whiteness of those spaces by bringing into high relief the black spatial protocols that were created there that didn't have a material form yet. So what would you have to cut away? What would you have to materialize? What would you have to ornamentalize to bring presence to what was invisible? That, that allowed them to work in conversation between whiteness and blackness. Mm -hmm. And because, at least in America, um, we tend to look at the black or the non-white as the race uh, category, that, was, that allowed them to speak to whiteness laterally by um, making blackness productive. So I, I tend to always um, allow people to talk about whiteness through a critique of whiteness. Um, and usually uh, through the ways that people of color or you know, um, same sex couples or anyone who's like non-normative in some kind of sense comes into a space and brings into high relief what it is that, that defines whiteness. Uh, and then, uh, I, I, what I've never asked my students to do, so I don't know how this would work, is like I haven't had a studio that said, I want you to redefine whiteness. I want you to take like this architecture and like create a new white architecture that isn't racist at all. And you know, I just think that that would be like such a big leap. Uh, I, so I'm trying to give them the tools by which they could slowly come upon a vocabulary, both materially and uh, you know, uh, uh, literally to articulate. Thank I don't you. know if like that would work in your context, but those are two things, one from Johannesburg, one from the States that I think, you know, might allow for. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. I think I'm realizing that the raise hand function is not operative somehow. So if you do have a question, if you could turn your camera on and, and physically raise your hand, um, that would help me. Um, I have a question. Ikeo sure. here. Go ahead. Um, hi, Charles. It's Ikeo hi. from... Auckland, Aotearoa. Um, I I really resonated with some of the content that with a lot of the content that you had provided. So I thank you for that. Um, what I thought uh, an anecdote that brought to mind that really affirmed the importance of um, affirming the positions or critiquing the position positions of whiteness within every stage of architecture school. Um, because I, I attended a thesis crit in my thesis year and um, one of the students made the bold move of purely writing their thesis Charles in, in Te Reo and speaking the entire crit in Te Reo. Um, so the participants, only a single person was able to really understand what was being distributed or um, being, being told and everyone else had to absorb it in some some way but um, the critique didn't go the crit felt burdened um, in my opinion when uh, one of the participants decided to not understand that the nature of this presentation actually was an entire different thought process a realm of its own um, governed by different methods that is probably not taught in architecture school. So it was, it was, it was decolonizing the curriculum, as you would say. Um, and in a way, in, an, in the haphazard nature of, of that response really reflected on how at different levels of the Institute, um, there is a degree of accountability 
that each participant has to come in as a as a staff member um, in that position to really provide the same level of um, critical nature that they would with white with white um, building projects and whatnot. Um, and so it burdened on me to, to kind of uh, provide insight that this is actually critiquing a different method of framing a conversation that we shouldn't propose what we know and we should actually expand on what this person is trying to tell us. But also before we even come to the conversation, we should adjust our bias in the very beginning in that moment. Um, as a Pacific Islander, it, it took maybe my third year to really look at my own indigenous architecture as a form of credible um, uh, resource because the way I was told in architecture school, there was a absence of um, reassurance or reaffirmation that there is a place for my indigenous um, uh, my indigenous architecture as a that e it equates to the cool house and to all the bow houses that we get retaught constantly, um, and I I do believe that there should be a critique of whiteness in our discipline before we enter the conversation of history. But also I question if there should be a co broader conversation reaffirming that, that, that question at every stage as you move through architecture school and with each semester. So that when it reaches a point where everyone should be at the table, everyone has been taught or somewhat um, through osmosis has have absorbed um, the necessary eloquence of and the vocabulary to kind of reach a point where they can address what they need to address before they enter a conversation like this. Mm -hmm. um, so that what really wasn't a question. I apologize. <laughs> no, actually, I I love this um, account that you have. Um, it reminds me of two things. Um, I I recently listened to a presentation by the art historian James Elkin. I mean, he, he was talking about the um, international publication arenas and what stands for the norms of this practice. And this, this, um, this belief that it is a bilateral kind of conversation. And he was talking about scholarship in China versus scholarship in the US. Um, and someone was writing uh, using a Roland Barthes as uh, one of their references. But they were using it uh, in the way that it was discussed in the Chinese context, which was not a kind of deep literature review that one might expect within uh, an American context, but it was used within uh, the way that art communities in China were referring to the land bar. And some of the comments that they got was, were that, uh, well, this isn't speaking enough to the kind of deep knowledge that a Western reader would have of this writer. Uh, and so they want this person to go back and rewrite that, you know, from essentially from the Western perspective, so that those English reading, English speaking, um, communities could then use this to then add to their own cultural capital. And so his question was, um, would that really be necessary in the Chinese context? And if not, then why would it even be necessary um, in this kind of um, space where you're expecting bilateral respect for the, the norms and practices on either side? And so um, what he's really getting at is that um, we talk about sort of knowing a lot about different cultures. But what we really mean is that we expect people to know these cultures from the Western perspective. And to always be talking about it using the English voice and to always be building that archive instead of building other archives. And so that's what I take from, from your um, instance, that there's an expectation that even if you are a person of color in a space getting a degree for your own reasons, that somehow you have to be a bicultural citizen and you have to always speak from the or through the language of the master, right? Uh, and, but that isn't always expected of the master to be able to speak the language of others. And so um, one of the things that I'm hearing from your uh, example is that there should be an expectation that everyone should become a bicultural subject, right? But then this makes architecture very difficult, right? Because it's very hard to be an expert on everyone's culture. And it's very hard to speak uh, with knowledge from everyone's perspective. 
So then we need a kind of procedure through which it's possible to grant someone who has native knowledge of something, a kind of authority that they come to the field with that is not always the, the things that we test for, right? In, in uh, uh, the theories of form, space, and order, and uh, modes of representation, and, and the norms that come through a white European discourse. I think that we literally, architects trained in this Western way, literally have no language to talk about this. So in that sense, there are no concepts or categories that they can use to critically think through the problem. And so for many people, even well-intentioned people, they just don't know how to deal with that situation. You know, they kind of like, they, they kind of grunt and, and, and go through it and think, wow, I could have handled that a little bit better, but you know, I don't really know how to grant the student the authority that they have from their cultural perspective and to meet them in the middle to kind of think through that problem. And I think that that's a, a project that has to be learned together, you know, with the student bodies that are coming in and the faculty bodies that are there. But it has to be an explicit project and it has to start from day one. And I think that that's kind of, at least in the States from my context is where we fail. Uh, we we want to train them so well in the master language that we don't learn, teach them how to speak bilaterally across cultures. And I think that, you know, we're, we're literally handicapping our designers in terms of global practices. And, and we're, we're setting them up to fail in ways that we can't even anticipate because we're not help, helping them to deal with that, that problem that you just talked about. So, I mean, like, I, I think that what you saw in that thesis um, uh, delivery was like one of the best lessons you could learn in architecture school. And I kind of wish that we had something like that every single semester here where I teach, like, like where there was this difficulty and, and people like, I just don't know what to say, or like, I don't know how to deal with that. And there's a common, uh, you know, putting of heads together to figure out how that works. I think that that would allow for us to develop the kind of pragmatic approaches and then the critical vocabularies that we need. But I, I, I can tell you this, um, that um, in the States, at least where I am, that there is uh, a demographic shift occurring. In the type of students who are applying to our schools, we're getting a lot more um, African Americans than we got previously, and a lot more Latinx students. And I think that over the course of time, that middle category of Latinx students is going to grow tremendously. Uh, we're going to feel pressure to understand uh, Spanish linguistics. We're going to feel pressure to understand uh, their their social customs in ways that we couldn't previously. And I think that that pressure is good. So from the student side, I think that it's good. Right now, it's sort of a burden upon the students, but. If we learn or accommodate it, I think it actually enrich our design culture. Thank you. No, great thank team. you for sharing that. That's yeah. a, that was a, a knockdown uh, experience. That's great. Um, we're just about coming to the end of the time that we have. Does anybody else have a question that they really want to share? Or and again, I'm afraid the hand function's not working, so you're just going to have to turn your camera on so we can see you. Okay, I don't see anything. Um, I, well, I just want to finish this session by thanking you so much, Charles. Um, this has been such a useful and enlightening session. Um, one thing I particularly want to say from my perspective is um, that I very much appreciate the way in which you acknowledge that historians often have to do the labor of anti-racist pedagogy because we are the ones who uh, talk about politics, economics, uh, race, uh, social context um, and I th think your challenge to that um, siloization is really crucial uh, for architecture schools as we rethink what an anti-racist um, curriculum is, not just an anti-racist architectural history. Um, so that's certainly what I'm going to take away from your really wonderful talk. Um, Chiara, thank you so much. And um, I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation that we're going to continue in our school and in the in the places that, uh, that we all work at the moment. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you guys for the invite.